little bit broader and maybe being a bit more provocative uh, on the facts that I will be challenged. But I think what that shows and what really was my eye-opener that in the, uh, in the online comments, it seems like once the animal is released, it's kind of hard to uh, bring it back. Uh, what we've seen in the kind of diversifying uh, of, of names which you know, we are made, trying to make sense of, it kind of means that once we allow the idea of banishment and of exile and of really excluding someone from our community, once we allow this and we kind of make this acceptable, uh, people will at this point only debate it what comes next. But what we also know is that discourse has shaped the, the context for new laws. So if you have uh, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the discourse already uh, the, a point that it is okay to take away someone's citizenship for all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of crimes, it is from then, I would argue, only a, a very kind of short step for new laws to, uh, to emerge uh, that would put this into practice. And that is the risk I'm seeing here. Uh, and so in this sense, I, I think that what the media reports and what the online debates are, are, are doing to this is, is important. And it's kind of scary to see that it kind of spreads and we, it's kind of hard to contain it once we have uh, made the first step and allowing some people saying, you know, you have no country, you're no longer a part of us. So I think that is it. Thank you. So the time now is uh, about 5.10, so we're now at the end of the fourth presentation panel. Uh, we'll have closing ceremonies uh, after with the closing comments by, yeah, okay. by, by Claire, um, and also Mr. Walwadi will also give us uh, an insight, followed by a reception at uh, 6 o'clock. So I hope that you'll join us for that as well. There's food and snacks. But before we get to that, we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, so if anyone does have a question, again, we'll follow the same format. What I'd like you to do is just go to the microphone, state your name and your affiliation, and if we could do our best, just keep it to a, a question. Um, so we have someone approaching your mic already. Just uh, give the audio take a second just to get the mic on. Clara Jimeno, researcher. With the data that you presented, the majority comes from uh, immigration and refugee bodies. So my assumption is that the data is underreported because there are people who are stateless in Canada who are not immigrants or refugees for what the other panels have uh, discussed in the morning. That one issue. The other is the census has the alternative of asking additional information for the specific groups. And I wonder if that would be a recommendation. For example, if in the census a person reports he is a second generation Canadian, then receives another questionnaire with the person can provide additional information. So then you can research what is the condition of the second generation related to the first generation of immigrants. That will be an alternative to get more information about people who reported their status in Canada. Then uh, my curiosity is, uh, with all the information that uh, you have been gathering through the different research projects, what are you doing with that? Is that going to be used for uh, as an advocacy tool, for example, Right now, those are just numbers in different kind of reports, but no faces. So are you going to invite people who are stateless to create a movement, or is just a kind of bodies that are going to develop research papers? So what you are going to do with that information? engage seals persons to uh, add a face to the figure, so to speak. Um, but we'll be definitely contacting CIC, IRB Stats, Canada, and CBSA to have those conversations and, and to clarify figures that we, that we need clarification on, as well as follow up with respect to our recommendations and have that frank discussion or, you know, these, these are the numbers, these are the gaps, and um, 
what are your thoughts on, on implementing change? The reason that we did this study was UNHCR did their study uh, with Mr. Brower in 2012, and they haven't, those four agencies haven't implemented those recommendations that, that were made in that paper. Um, and some of those, most of those recommendations we echo and we add further recommendations, and I think a, a frank discussion needs to be had with all, with each agency, and why are these, in, these recommendations not being implemented? So both, both, definitely. Robert Addington, lost the Indian School. One minute this time. Uh, a brief note of treason. Uh, for various political and historical reasons, which I won't go into, treason trials have become extremely rare in democratic countries, even in wartime. The last treason trials in Canada, to my knowledge, were in 1885, after the Northwest Rebellion. There were none during or after the First or the Second World War. So I submit that treason in this context is effectively a red herring. Yes, I think uh, you're, you're entirely right. They just needed to make uh, something, say something else in terrorism. I think the, uh, why the, uh, the, uh, this uh, came into being is, was the first bill stipulated act of law, which legally, uh, you know, the lawyers correct me in the room, uh, does not exist. Uh, so they, and uh, even at that point, um, Jason Kenney added uh, terrorism to it. Uh, and I think that was the main target as proven. It's just, you have to kind of take them by their word and then show that that was not the, the way. I mean, I agree with you. Thank you. Just to, uh, if I can clarify, uh, there was a... Oh, I'm Don Chapman of the Lost Canadians. Uh, there was a uh, Japanese gentleman uh, that was found guilty of treason after World War II. Uh, you, re you might remember, and he was uh, considered a British subject, but he was Canadian from, uh, I think, Kamloops. So uh, the other aspect and the thing that you have to realize, and I've argued this in front of Parliament because they said you could not have dual citizenship. So if that's the case, uh, why was Louis Riel hanged? Treason. But Louis Riel was an American citizen. So that kind of answers the question, how could you hang somebody who did, that, for treason if he wasn't a Canadian citizen? If the government says citizenship, you couldn't have dual. So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why the government owes Louis Riel an apology, but that's also one that nobody's thought of. Does anyone else in the audience have any questions? If not, uh, I could fill in some questions. I was just wondering, I, I just had, I had a quick question. Revocation's always been at the, uh, the pest of the minister. It's been something that's been in their kind of toolbox for a while. Why do you think that revocation has become so popular uh, in terms of public discourse now? And, and have you done any research in regards to revocation and statelessness in particular? To be, to be quite honest, I think this is a, uh, is, a, is a political move. It was a political move at the time. We're, we're in power. We, we can do something, and we do something against those people. And even if they're not na na named, but like like the Omar Carters, uh, uh, so that we can actually take away. The, and I think Kenny is on the record for saying uh, that he wish he could do this to everyone, uh, but unfortunately he had to abide to uh, you know the treaties that were or signed by by Canada. Uh, otherwise, it is. Uh, he would, it would not only affect dual, uh, dual Canadians, uh, citizenship, but, but others. But I think it's a, it's a political move to speak to one, his, or some of his, the, the, the people who would vote uh, for, for his party. I don't know. Can I once again comment? I was involved in that. I was involved with the LC37, the second generation board abroad. I was involved with the Seoul BC24 on the revocation. You are absolutely correct. It was totally political, and it was uh, catering to his political base. Uh, 
Uh, I'm really interested, to, I don't know if you have any data on this specific issue as to the orders in council that were ever issued, personal to revocation procedure being, the revocation procedure, the orders in council, because these orders in council are simply a summary of the decision. Here, Mr. Swinsor is granted back his uh, citizenship. Are there been any motivation, any explanation as to why some of them were granted? And most interestingly, why would the uh, recourse that was now available up until the modification to the uh, New Citizenship Act, why was the revocation process and the recourse that was available to the Governor and Council, why was it abolished? Have you had a chance to look at that? Yeah. Sorry. Uh I only got part of what you said, it's just because you're too tall for the mic. Um, so I only got, got part of what... Uh... Well, you know, just I'll summarize that again. So you know that up until last year, after revocation, it was possible to appeal this revocation to the governing council. Now, I'm just interested in looking back at history. Were there any studies, were there any analysis as to those who have obtained by ordering council their citizenship back in terms of it could be stateless person, it could be for whatever purposes. Okay, that is an excellent question and that is really something that, that should be uh, be done. Again, as I said, I would, none of us is, is a legal scholar, so that would be, but I, as far as, I, I, we don't know of any studies uh, that have been done, but that would be, I think, something that uh, Justin would be interested in, in, in getting. Um, but unfortunately, I, I can't answer the question. I didn't figure you could, which is asking. Bank? Yeah, yeah. I, I, could I, think it's, I, think, I think it's good to have this as a question and as a research topic, if there's any uh, MA students, PhD students uh, in the room, on, on the book. I mean, is this really something that I think needs to be done? Right. I, I can again shed a little bit of light on that. Andrew Talegi was parliamentary secretary to the citizenship minister, Eleanor Kaplan, many years ago. And the idea of revocation came up with is it Helmut Oberlander? And uh, Andrew resigned over that issue because what they wanted to do, and this was the Liberal Party of Canada at the time, they wanted to be able to have the minister strip somebody of citizenship. Andrew said, no, if you have fraud or anything involved and you want to strip citizenship, okay, fine, but make it through the court system and have a judicial hearing and everything is legally done that way and get the politicians out of it. Uh, it ended up where Andrew resigned. They did strip Oberlander of his citizenship, and he was just restored, I believe, about a week ago. Okay. I think I just want to add also that, um, you know, Canada is certainly not alone in using citizenship revocation as punishment. This is a trend that is um, really gaining traction in a lot of industrialized countries, or I don't know about a lot, but I know for sure in England and France, um, we're starting to see this more and more. So it's just part of the ongoing thrust of the neoliberal um, slashers that are, you know, making, going to extremes now to um, punish people, and this is a new way that they have found to do that. Go ahead, yeah. So I'm uh, Maureen Lynch, I'm an independent humanitarian advocate who works on behalf of Stateless, um, previously worked for Refugees International and affiliated with the International Observatory on Stateless and Space in Middlesex, uh, London. Um, here's my question, I hope it's not too small, but I appreciate the fact that um, folks in Canada are doing research and getting some numbers, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, so my question, hope again, it's not too small. A uh, reference was made to statistics from the CIC um, using the word stateless international students. And this just kind of puzzled me because typically a stateless person can't be an international student, and so on and so forth. And I'm just hoping you could discuss that stat a little further. Who are they exactly? What is this situation? Thanks. No idea. That's just on CIC open data table, open data table. Open Data Initiative table on their website, and they have 48 tables, and each table identifies uh, or, or provides figures with respect to all sorts of different classes of, of um, immigrants, and uh, that's the number for stateless international 
um, students, and I raised my eyebrows when I saw that as well. So these again are our preliminary findings. So what we're hoping to do is have a conversation with CIC and, and talk through those numbers. Um, also, that 316,739 number, I mean, where did that come from? So that's a good point. Yeah, that, is, that would be excellent to find out. Yeah, I, that. I just got one uh, last comment to, uh, I think, Josh's uh, question, but it, on the revocation side, I think what we, in the larger picture, it's maybe too large, but uh, I think we should also think about the, the, the recent two things. First of all, we're increasingly having more uh, dual citizens, and uh, there is, states are now realizing that they have obligations to dual citizens, and I think we're seeing a backlash against that. The other thing, what is recently, I mean, look at the, the, today's uh, um, uh, media, uh, is the punitive uh, kind of punishment system that we have, and it has been uh, increasingly punitive. That's very much less restorative. And I think uh, revocation uh, and statelessness fall really in that trend that we, uh, you know, call it, uh, call it conservatives, call it, um, you know, neoliberal, that, you know, we don't want to pay for these people, not even in prison, we just basically send them off uh, where they came from. The problem is, uh, do we do any good with that by sending anyone off um, to countries where they maybe never have been, and do they want to take them back? And also the whole idea is that we can actually punish people for, for, for their crime, whatever crimes uh, they have done. I think that is... Uh, um, in that sense, uh, the revocation is in line with, you know, those of you working in criminology with a really punitive uh, kind of punishment system. And I guess just picking up off of that, and the last question, unless it sparks any other questions, is generally migration and immigration process is not a crime and being born is not a crime so I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel wants to speak to the kind of uh, increasing or kind of salient um, reality where statelessness immigration and remigration are becoming increasingly interconnected um, and sometimes to the point where it's actually abscones or excuse of fate um, or it hides in a sense uh, human rights responsibilities so I'm just wondering since you talked about discourse and discursive regimes if you could talk to the increasing kind of reframing of the issue of immigration and especially uh, in relation to statelessness and being born you know which is not a, an offense I probably should wait for the next speaker, but I think uh, uh, because the next, the next question, uh, you brought up the uh, idea of crimigation. So the idea that it's almost a crime to kind of migrate and flee, and that this in public discourse and political discourse, a crime to arrive in, uh, in, 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 in any country without, uh, without actually uh, papers, which is quite uh, at, at odds with the definition of uh, being refugees. I mean, I'm just kind of sorry, I, I don't flee my country and say, oh no, I have to get back to go get my papers. I mean, if really you're in threat of persecution, um, you are a refugee by, uh, it's actually a performative act. If I'm saying I'm a refugee, I have the right to be uh, uh, treated as one and uh, uh, the right to a fair hearing. So in that sense, uh, yes, I think that is, uh, you know, migration, leaving, um, your that country that is either you, because you're looking for better opportunities or you're fleeing a, a civil war is in itself uh, increasingly seen as a, as a crime uh, um, and I think uh, uh, Canada hopes that people just stay there and wait uh, peacefully and so someone comes and rescues them but uh, this is not a right of a refugee. Okay. My name is, oh sorry, go ahead. My name is still Maeve and I'm still a professor at Cardiff. <laughs> I hope. Um, I just wanted to add, I guess, a note of caution. There seems to be a consensus that we need a new citizenship law. And I guess my note of caution is that if that is to proceed, that to urge people in the know to be very vigilant in what the current legislation gets replaced with. Um, one of the reasons I'm saying that, and it's somewhat related is because of what happened in Canada with our extradition law and the extradition law that we have right now is relatively recent at 1999 but from my limited knowledge which is rapidly advancing I would argue that Canadian citizens for example have a lot less rights now 
under this newer legislation than they had under the previous legislation. And one person who most of you know his name, if you don't know him personally, is Hassan Dia, who is currently sitting in prison in Paris. And he was got there through this modernised extradition law. So just a, a note of caution. Thank you so much. Once again, Don Chapman, Lost Canadians. Uh, this is my fourth Prime Minister I've dealt with, and we are involved. It's our group that's really involved in this, hopefully, new citizenship act. We'd like all of you to be involved in it. Uh, with the uh, issue of uh, statelessness, where you were talking about people going to different countries, there is a future liability of all the children, like the Haitian children. How do you take babies that you adopt into Canada because they had an earthquake and you have, they have no identification as to who they are? That's the problem I'm facing today with a lot of World War I and World War II soldiers, or soldiers, uh, families and children and so forth. So this is an issue that's not talked about much, but we have a huge problem that's looming on the horizon that we have to look at because those children will be tomorrow's lost Canadians. Thank you. Uh, yes, you're right. But on the other hand, I think if you adopt, you can still opt for the old version. I think you're, you're, you're right that the new, uh, the new law is that, but you, however, if you adopt, you have the, the choice between the two, uh, the two versions, and that's the same. And I totally agree. But if citizenship is a product of legislation, and it is the legislation de jour of the parliamentarians that happen to be in parliament, that's why we're trying to get citizenship a legislate, I mean a uh, constitutional privilege. And, you know, I've been through now, this is my fourth prime minister, there was no prime minister that was harder to work with and didn't care in any way, shape, or form than Stephen Harper. He was by far the worst, and the worst citizenship minister was Jason Kenney. And when I went to say that in testimony, in Parliament, in front of David Tilson, who was the then chair of the committee in 2009, I started to say, this is the worst government I've dealt with. My microphone went dead and I was asked to leave. <laughs> well, my microphone is still working, so I, um, <laughs> I just wanted to thank the panelists. It's 5.30 now, so um, I just want to thank the panelists for their uh, insights, especially with uh, the mapping statelessness study. I'm very interested to hear how this goes. Um, so please keep updated on the Canadian Center on Statelessness as a website um, with regards to the progress of that and also the illuminating statistics provided by both Patrick and Jocelyn give us an idea of where individuals with um, contingent precarious legal statuses in this country uh, are sitting with regards to uh, CIC, um, the Immigration and Refugee Board, and of course the Canadian Border Services Agency. And lastly but not least, we can see that the contingent layered ways in which executive power, often arbitrary, is kind of co-mingling and mixing with these ideas of belonging and uh, legal bureaucracy, uh, which appear to be uh, meshed. So at this moment in time, I just give a round of applause to the uh, presenters. Um, at this time, like I said, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Jacob uh, Wawadi, who RB was introduced this morning, um, to the stage to provide some uh, closing ceremonies. And then after that, Dr. Claire Dali will give us some closing comments. And then following that, if you're still with me, um, we're going to have a reception at the back where all the food's already ready. There is a cash bar, I believe. Um, and we're really looking forward to it. So please uh, welcome again Mr. Jacob Wawadi to the stage. like um, Jacob to just sort of tie the bow around the day after everybody has finished doing the talking. Um, I have an announcement to make first, and that is that whereas um, Tarane was supposed to do a poster presentation at 6.30, um, I think it's being moved up a little bit. 
And so I heard 6.15, but she may do it earlier than that too. So Tarane will be at the back doing a poster presentation. Uh, Tarane Etamadi, who is a, uh, a University of Windsor student, um, who's also involved in the Canadian Centre on Statelessness. So please do drop by and see what she has to present. Thank you. Um, so, listen, it's um, a little overwhelming at this play, at this stage of the game. Just look at who is in the room and look at who has been in and out of this room all day. Um, Certainly, we have seen and heard many different voices, and this just allows us to reflect on the fact that there are every different kind of person who is somehow concerned with statelessness. So we have the stateless people themselves who came, we have people who have legal expertise on these issues, other types of scholars who look at other things, people who are close to people who are stateless, people who are grassroots activists. We have people who work in agencies, NGOs, other grassroots um, community groups, and we have students. Am I missing anybody? We have a whole range of people, people who work independently, people who are indigenous and concerned about it, so a whole range of people. So much we were able to see today that much has already been done and how much more there is left to do. And so I would like to just um, focus um, a little bit of attention on the potential that this room is holding right at this moment and how this is um, a sort of a uh, an opportunity to launch in some sort of collaborative um, network of people who are going to continue to communicate with one another in various different ways around various different conversations about how to eradicate statelessness in Canada. Thank you so much for being here. It is very touching to see you all. And I'd like you to just bear with me as I have a few people that I would like to thank. Um, first and foremost, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank stateless people for coming and all of the um, presenters for presenting and the chairs for chairing these panels. Thank you very much. It's been very enriching all day. Um, I, there's a few people that I need to thank. Um, I would like to thank the people at the UNHCR. Furio, thank you. I'd like to thank Nadia Williamson for her part that she's played in this really hardworking and um, really diligent. And um, Giselle Niembe as well. And Josh Bushka, thank you so much for being the MC. You're a wonderful MC. Um, I would like to thank the Department of Criminology at the University of Ottawa for contributing to this event. I'd like to thank the Human Rights Research and Education Center, in particular John Packer and Viviana Fernandez. I'd like to also thank the Association of Part-Time Professors at the University of Ottawa for their contribution. I'd like to thank OPERG for its very um, big contribution. And I'd also like to thank the CCS for its contribution in kind, which has been a really quite a large contribution. So thank you to all those people. I would like to thank um, the caterers um, for their work today. I'd like to thank the students for their volunteering that they did to help us put, pull this together. I'd like to thank the rapporteurs in particular for taking such diligent notes and the folks that worked at the registration desk. I'd like to thank um, Adam in particular because he did a lot of work with his camera today. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'd like to thank the other people that worked with cameras um, recording this session. I think that is um, very, very um, gracious of you to do that. I would like to thank also my partners. Um, I'd like to thank Maria, Maria and Marcelo. Thank you so much um, for all your support and for all your um, wisdom um, as we prepare to do this. And I'd like to thank also um, the Canadian Centre on Statelessness, in particular Jocelyn, but also Teresa Dillon, who was also very, very much part of this 
organization. Um, I do hope I'm not going to forget anybody because I would really um, feel bad if I did, but I, I really want to um, most especially thank folks like Don Chapman for coming. That was really enriching, Don, so thank you for your presence. And also, Robert, you had some really excellent things to contribute. 